Hello, everyone, and welcome to Bold TV. I'm Philip Michael. And I'm Jen Gottlieb. Let's get right into this week's headlines, starting with the scary storm that is sweeping the country. A Category 4 hurricane named Laura hit Texas and, Louis Texas and Louisiana this week, right after Tropical Storm Marco hit a few days before. We saw devastation in Louisiana and up to 150 mile per hour winds. Now experts are predicting a very active season, so we're not out of the woods yet. Philip, are you prepared for more storms? I've, I mean, we've already had two in the Northeast already. I'm not ready. Uh, yeah, and it's kind of crazy. It's, it's blown all over, lots of rain. Um, but I'm in the house anyway, so. I know. We're yeah. in the house anyway. <laughs> anyway, so in tech news, there's a new struggle between Facebook and Apple, two giants colliding. Uh, Apple's new software update puts user privacy ahead of advertiser dollars. As you probably know, companies use our data to send us targeted ads, and this can be really creepy. Now, Apple is allowing users to use their latest operating system to block that tracking feature, so that means no more targeted ads. Mm -hmm. I imagine a lot of people would want to opt out of targeted ads, but what are the businesses going to say? I know. I don't think they're going to be very happy. So, in other news, some of the executives who took pay cuts at the beginning of the pandemic are now once again getting paid their pre-pandemic salaries. And Disney being one of the companies, one of the companies restoring executive salaries, meaning they just reported, meanwhile, sorry, they just reported a five billion dollar loss and furloughed workers and just last week another million americans filed for unemployment hmm that's uh what's going on there yeah yeah <laughs> lastly <No comment>. <laughs> <laughs> lastly some surprising news uh the suburbs are becoming uh, popular again so many people have left phil mm -hmm. i mean i know hundreds i feel like of people that have left new york literally heading for the suburbs and their second homes in rural areas yeah and it's pretty common now to see people turning their vacation homes into their permanent homes i have friends that are calling me from delaware from yeah. colorado and everywhere is like their vacation homes are now their permanent homes the hamptons with most jobs going remote a lot of people are realizing that if they don't have to go to the office maybe cities aren't worth it yeah because you think in new york uh most most of the people here are, are renters and yeah. you're paying a lot for real estate and if they're if there's the magic of New York City, if nothing is going on, what are you really here, folks? And it's not just New York either. It's San Francisco, it's Jacksonville, Seattle, Florida, Houston, Texas. People are just moving out. Do you think you'll move to the suburbs? No, because I think I have to be in the mix of things, just, yeah. just, just the way that we operate right now. But I, part of me wants to just go camp out somewhere, to be honest with you. I believe in New York City. I believe, I believe, and every single time I'm like, oh my God, New York City is not the same. I just have faith, and I'm going to stay put. It's going gonna, it's gonna to come back, and at some point it's going to be like it never was here. All right, next, let's talk about finances and mental health with the author of The Passion Economy, Adam Davidson. Mm, welcome, Adam. So millennials have been called the most anxious generation. Do you think a lot of the stress is because of finances? I do. And I just want to mention I'm a lifelong New Yorker who's now in Vermont. So um, oh, there you go. Oh, there you go. There's yeah. one. There's another one. 101 of my friends now. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I think we are going through a massive transformational uh, financial and economic change in the fundamental logic of how it how life works, how you make a living, how you create mm -hmm. a career or a business. And that is freaking people out, I think, like any major transformation, there's a lot of pain. There's also some really, really good news, and that might be harder for people to hear sometimes with all the all the bad news. But yes, um, I, I was born in 1970. The 20th century was one of, even for the wars and the depression, it was one of the most stable, solid financial periods in human history. Mm -hmm. And we're not there now, and that is really scary for a lot of people. So speaking of scary, how can we ease some of the... Uh financial anxiety that exists with people today, especially in a, in a, in a, in the conditions that we live in right now. How can, how can we sort of do that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I do think it's helpful to have some perspective. That's really hard to do when you're, you know, stuck in your apartment and, uh, you know, maybe worried about rent, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But um, weirdly, I take a lot of comfort in the idea that we're going through a big change, and a big change means new rules, new ways of working. Um, to me, the core of this change is actually good news, especially for younger people who I think prize individuality and their own passions more than maybe my generation did, um, which is that if you think of the 20th century, it was all about scale, about mass mm -hmm. production, about right. 
being a company person, about doing the job you're assigned and leaving your uniqueness at home. Uh, this new economy, and this is basically my whole idea in the passion economy, um, is all about uniqueness, that yeah. anything that's routine, that's repeatable, that um, is going to be done by a computer or it's going to be outsourced to some other low-wage country, the only way to get ahead is to really define who you are uniquely, what you can do, what you love to do, and then figure out how to tell people about it, how to sell it to an employer or sell it as a business. Mm -hmm. Do you find that that causes more anxiety for people to have to figure out what they're going to do next or less? I think it causes more short-term anxiety for sure. I mean, I like to compare it to 120 years ago when America and much of the world was in the midst of, a rep of shifting from an agricultural world to an industrial world. Mm. And if you think of like a kid born on a farm in, say, 1880, they are born into a world where everyone's a farmer. Most people don't go to high school, something like 10% of Americans went to high school in 1900. Most people just do what their mom and dad did. And suddenly they're in this new world with factories and, and pretty soon they're hearing about education and all these new things. It's terrifying, it's confusing. And it takes a while for society to get a language and an understanding of what growth looks like. I mean, I, I would think if you told a farmer in 1885 or 1893, hey, your kids should go out of the workforce for four years, do this thing called college, where they major in some abstract thing like reading books or engineering, and then they'll make more money the rest of their life. That farmer would have been like, what are you talking about? That's ridiculous. <laughs> the, the cows need milking this morning. And I think it's similar. Our passion is not like just something you're born with or you don't have it. It's Figuring out your specialness, that takes time. That's harder than college. That's like, you know, I think my, it, I was in my 30s before I really knew what mine was. Um, but it's worth it. Like college is worth it. Like a lot of things that are hard are worth it. It's worth it to refine your uniqueness. It takes time, though, and that's okay. It also takes confusion and uncertainty. That's part of it. That's a mm. part of the process. You're easing my stress. Go ahead. Yes. Talk, talk, you mentioned finding your own uniqueness and in today's climate, how can, I think you touched on this a little bit, but I'd like to know uh, if you can expound on this a little bit more. What about today's economy and how can people define their uniqueness? How can they take advantage and capitalize or yeah, capitalize on the current set of circumstances that we live under right now? According to you. So, um, yeah, and, and I do not want to underplay the short term. Like, obviously, we're in the midst of an insane period of human history and, and a short term, like, economic true crisis. Um, but also, we're in the midst of a major economic change. Mm -hmm. So, people say in their 20s today are going through a lot of pressures that basically no one in human history has faced, which is not to say people didn't face worse pressures. It's just these are unique. Um, here's what I would say that mm -hmm. the safest place to be is in this economy, is to have a clear thing you are bringing to market. And by that, I mean either to the job market or to a business as an entrepreneur that you can uniquely do. And that's, that's abstract. That's why I wrote a long book with lots of examples and have a podcast with lots of examples because I find for me the examples are great, hearing the examples. And maybe it'd be helpful if I gave a quick example. I'd love um, a quick example. Give me a quick example of a way that you can reduce stress during this time, like a, a tactical tool that I can go do when I leave here. Sure. So I think the core thing is to begin to go on a path towards figuring out what do I uniquely have to offer the world. And um, what, I love the example of Cos Marte, who's in my book and in my podcast. He was a drug kingpin in the New York of the late 1990s at 18, 19 years old, making millions of dollars. He was actually a very innovative drug business person because he was new to text messaging and he figured out how to kind of go up market and bring drugs to upper class people and charge them far more than he could in the Lower East Side where he was from. But then he went to jail. He had a real conversion and felt terrible about what he had done. He got out of jail and was living on his mom's couch, broke, nothing going on. The one thing he had is he's a charming guy who's really good at encouraging people. And he had worked out every day in his prison cell and was really buff. And so he started going to the park every morning and just saying to passersby, can I train you for free? I'll just train you. And over some period of time, he developed a few dozen people who just, that was their morning routine. They'd go on the FDR drive in New York um, 
and meet up with Koss at six in the morning, seven in the morning, and um, and he would train them. And eventually he had such a great response that he was able to convince a landlord to let him open uh, a gym called Conbody, which is a it literally looks like a prison cell. All the trainers are ex-cons, although very carefully screened. I've heard of this, actually. This is yeah, awesome. Yeah, it's a yeah. great place. And I think of Cos Marte sitting on his mom, sleeping on his mom's couch, waking up on his mom's couch, an ex-con. His only job experience was selling drugs. He was now a Christian. He would not sell drugs ever again. Nobody in the world is more hopeless than that guy. And he just goes to the gym and... It starts with one person, then it's three people, then seven people. Yeah. And, and that's the kind of thing that, you know, finding your passion means clicking, you know, usually the thing that makes you special, 97% of people aren't going to get it. And and the first 97 people you tell it to are probably going to be like, what are you talking about? That's nothing. But finding those, that last 3% who are really going to get it just takes time. Love but once it. you click with them then you're off to the races. So where can people find you? Where where can they get your book? Tell us a little bit about you before we move on. Sure, passioneconomy.com. Love it. So the book, I'm very proud of. There's also a podcast where I just, really all I do, the book, the podcast, I just talk to people who've actually done this. Compelling, heroic people. I chose people who weren't born rich, didn't inherit you know, their parents' company. They, they just did this. And then I extract lessons from them that I think are applicable to most of our lives. So I really tried to make it as easy to read and enjoyable. I will say, I used to say before COVID, um, you really need some period of self-reflection. And I obviously this situation is terrible, but if you're stuck at home, if you're not sure what to do, using this time for introspection and figuring out what makes you unique is going to be a really valuable way to spend your your time right now. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here, Adam. You're amazing. I can't wait to go check out your book and we will talk to you soon. Thank you guys. That was Thank awesome. you. All right. So this pandemic has us all thinking about our mental and physical health with gyms opening back up again, like what Adam was talking about. And let's talk about the economics of having a gym membership. Yeah. So these gyms will take your money whether you go or not, which is which is fair. Uh, But a recent survey found that 63 percent of gym membership go unused and over 80 percent are only used once a week. This means you have to look at how much you're paying per trip and evaluate your budget. If you're paying $50 per month for a gym membership and you only go twice, then you're literally paying 25 bucks every time you go to the gym. That's a really crazy way to look at it. I know. I've never looked just, at it that way. Right. If you're just a casual gym goer, then you can pick a cheaper option. You may have a routine, but even that will get interrupted if you're sick, injured, or go on vacation. Mm -hmm. However, going to the gym can lower your health care. Uh, healthier people, they spend less because they're more likely to avoid health issues. And going to the gym has many benefits, but you have to be aware of how much you're really spending every month. Do you go to the gym? Well, the gym is closed. So, and there's a fabulous gym in the building that I live in, and mm -hmm. I do have a membership, but and that's been charged. And I don't know why, because everything's been closed. So there's, so there's something to be said for that point. Something to be If said. you want more tips to keep your money in check, stay tuned for our next guest. I am super excited because she's a financial coach known as the Dividend Diva. Yes, the Dividend Diva. That's right. Welcome, welcome, Karen Williams. Hi. Hi. This is Karen Williams. Great to meet you guys. So awesome. good to meet you. Let's let's jump right into it. Do young people today treat money differently than their parents did? As a matter of fact, they do. Actually, a lot of millennials uh, treat their money differently because they grew up in families that had a lot of struggle. They grew up with parents who had a lot of credit card debt. So actually, millennials, um, the ones that I work with, are doing a great job at handling their money. They're trying to become financially literate a lot earlier. Mm. So I'm really excited about what I see uh, millennials doing with their money. So you help people create financial to-do lists. Is that what you do? I help people create financial plans that help them achieve their personal goals in life. I'm extremely concerned about communities of color, but I help anyone who comes my way who wants to make a difference with the money that they earn. Mm. Interesting. You mentioned one thing of color. And one of the things that on my side that I work on during the pandemic is this mission to help 100,000 people of color become millionaires by investing and turning them into first time investors. See, a lot of people going on the use of Robin Hood has just exploded. What are some of the things that you're seeing, particularly in that community, 
and during this pandemic. What are you sort of seeing there? I am seeing people take advantage of the opportunity that they have with their time. I'm seeing mm. people take time to get on Zooms. I've conducted so many workshops. I'm seeing people really log in and try to figure out how the stock market works, how they can invest. They're using um, LVEST. That's something that's created for women. I'm seeing people use stock slices, which where you can buy stock at five in $5 increments. Yeah. Definitely seeing mm -hmm. Robinhood. So I'm seeing people just engage with their money. They have time mm. and they're learning. And I'm excited about it. That's so exciting. If you could give millennials one tip, like the main tip that you would give, what would it be mm. to help them manage their finances? Good question. Wow. To give them one. Oh, gosh. I have about three in my head. But if I would say for millennials pay your bills on time. Mm. All right. And the, and the reason I say that is 35% of your credit score is based on timeliness of payment. So if you can't do anything else, pay your bills on time. That'll protect your credit score and your credit score helps you in several other areas of your life. Mm. All right. You heard it from the Dividend Diva. We have to pay our bills on time. Speaking of, I want to know where you got this name from, the Dividend Diva. Tell me about it. Um, I am known uh, in my community for kind of having a glamorous uh, appearance. And so uh, glamour was a name that I was given when I pledged my sorority many years ago. And so when I went to uh, study financial literacy, I'm a product of Rice University's uh, certified financial planning program. Um, I decided that I wanted to make learning about money fun. Mm. And I thought you could still be exciting and you could still collect dividends while being a diva. And so I just thought it was a catchy name that, you know, <laughs> would, would define me, but also make me approachable to people who really want to learn about their finances. So it's all about by relatability. Uh, where can people find you? People can find me on social media, on all, on all handles with the Dividend Diva on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter. Uh, they can find me on Amazon if they'd like to purchase my latest book. I'm not hard to find, and money is not hard to make. If you have a plan, you can make it. Yes. <laughs> I like it. Yes, Karen, I love thank it. You, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we'll make sure we keep in touch and, and dive more into what you're doing. All right. I'll see you soon. <laughs> Thank you, right. Dividend Diva. Love her. Super yes, fun, super glamorous. I love that money can be fun and it can be glam and it indeed, doesn't have to be indeed. boring. Um, so awesome. Okay. So, Philip, do you think money can buy happiness? Can money buy happiness? Um, no, I don't think so. But money removes uh, removes the element of struggle. They say, I'm, I'm Danish, right? They say, Denmark is the happiest nation in the world. Yeah. And people say, is everyone smiling and being happy? No. But what it does, it removes the element of struggle. And people equate that to happiness. But once you get past never having to struggle, which is what money gives you, yeah. you still have the emotional spectrum of being sad, happy. That fluctuation will mm -hmm. always exist. So you can't buy happiness, but you can eliminate struggle with happiness. That's my position. I love that. Yeah. So the old saying might have some truth to it. Historically, people thought that there was a level of wealth where your happiness would level off. Yeah, and the study you're talking about found that if you made $75,000 per year, you're happier than the average person. But after that income level, happiness leveled off, leveled off which, I can, which I can believe. So now a more recent study found that happiness continues to rise far beyond a certain comfortable level. Past 100K, happiness was still on the rise. And let's face it, poverty is stressful, which I mentioned. With more money, more of your needs are met. And these are things like owning a house, a car, a stable job, and starting a family. This all makes us happy in theory. M makes us happy in theory. Right, exactly, right. Yes. exactly. So. All right, so let's end the show talking about a body part most of us take for granted. I'm Our excited feet. about this. Yes. So we have Charlie Lundy from Dr. Scholes with us. D did I say that right? Yeah, yeah. Dr. Right. Scholes. Hello, Charlie. Ah, how y'all doing? We are so good. I'm super excited, Charlie, because I actually put heels on for the very first time in like four months. So I can't wait well, to talk to you about it. You're a rare that. bird. Not many people are doing that these days. For real, for real. And it was uncomfortable. So you're a foot expert, feet expert. So tell us, like, people are at home and they're wearing slippers and they're wearing socks and they're not used to, you know, putting on their shoes. So what's going to happen right. when people start to do that? Is that going to change things for our feet and our foot health? 
It is. So just like you said, we've been indoors for six months and we have been sitting around on our couch or our kitchen table and we're doing everything from working and feeding our kids and raising our family. And we really haven't gotten a lot of uh, exercise and our feet hasn't either. So it's been really a rough ride for our feet the last few months. And the other thing is 80% of the people that we ask uh, are either wearing socks or slippers all day. Mm. Uh, wow. So that's really tough. We weren't built to walk on concrete and tile and hardwood floors. Interesting. And one of the things, just like you say, the uh, people underestimate the importance of feet and all the pressure points and stuff that sit there. So is there truth to it? And I know a lot of people will stand in line to buy some J's and some Jordans and stuff like that. But is it true that the more money we spend on shoes, the happier our feet will be? Is there a correlation there? Happy feet equals happy mind. Talk Absolutely. to me about that. Oh, yes. Absolutely. So we know the value of your feet being comfortable really affects your ent your entire body. You can do more things. You're more willing. You get less fatigued. Hmm. So, th I mean, that's what we try to do in our products. That happy feet. Happy it makes your whole body lasts longer, and, and that's what we're trying to do. Yeah, sometimes I find that the more expensive my shoes are, the more uncomfortable they are, actually. <laughs> so, well, a lot of times that's true. I mean, a, a shoe is going to spend most of their money so that it looks good, not necessarily that it feels good. And, and so sometimes that's right. Sometimes you need something inside that shoe to make it feel better. What's the best way to transition back into normal shoes? So would it be smart after walking around for months in our slippers and our socks to just throw on our heels and go walk outside or should we do a slow transition? So your feet are not ready for what's coming. I've got to tell they're you. They're not so ready? I know, they already feel not it. Ready. Um, you really, so here's two things I think you should do every day. Exercise your feet a little bit. Do some cur uh, toe curls, toe lifts, um, stretch your Achilles tendon out and everybody walk, get out there and walk some every day. Just be supported when you do so that you build up your feet muscles and your lower leg muscles and you're, you're really more ready. And when you're out there again, you know, hopefully we're thinking in the spring, this all gets a lot better. Do wear shoes with some support in it. And if you need some, of course, we make some products just for them. <laughs> You got me rocking my feet back and forth right now. Uh, what are some quick tips? What, one thing, I get reflexology treatments once or twice a week. What are some other tips for people that have foot pain right now that they can do outside so, of that? So one thing, so uh, like a massage ball that really helps, whether it's a tennis ball or literally a massage ball or baseball, um, that really is helpful. Massaging your feet. You, reflexology is, of course, awesome. Uh, but you really want to stimulate the blood flow in your feet and get your toes moving around, get the plantar fascia on the bottom of your foot, really keep that stretched and, and not too tight. And uh, there's a perfect example, take a towel and stretch your feet. All that's to really loosen up the bottom of your foot and keep it healthy. I love that. I'm actually going to go home and do those things because I'm walking around in these heels right now and they hurt. However, I have to call you out because I do have a Dr. Scholl's pad in my heel right now and it is making it a lot easier. Thank you very much. I, I hope it's wow. Okay. Look at that. We do. All right. We do. It's not a lot of room in that shoe, I bet you, but we have figured out a way to really offload the, the big toe and the uh, ball of foot area to make high heel walking a little better. Yeah. You know, you know, it's funny. I've had a bad big toe since 2007. I've been trying all sorts of stuff to figure that out. So I might have to look into that. That's right. That's right. Try it. Try an orthotic uh, and just get some cushioning yeah. under that big toe. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Get yeah. It's impeded my sprinting for years. That. So I'll look into that. Yeah. Well, good luck. All right. Good luck. Charlie, you rock. Thank you so much. And hey, watch uh, your feet and have a good weekend. You too. <laughs> all right. Philip. That's the end of our show. That was lit. Yeah, that was lit. Yeah. That was awesome. Thank okay. you guys so much for watching. And check us out again on Bold TV. And of course, follow Bold TV on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, Facebook, Amazon, Fire TV, and Roku. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel. Mm, all the things. Subscribe to all the things. And we will see you next week. All right. Bye.